Hey folks, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant and this is the afternoon session. Good to have you along. Well, uh, you know, it's Friday afternoon, but we aren't slowing down. I'm telling you, we are deep in the case in Tennessee against Eric Boyd. If you've been following it all, you know this is the gruesome uh, murder case uh, involving Shannon Christian, the 21 year old girl from uh, the University of Tennessee and her boyfriend Christopher Newsom, both brutally tortured, raped, ultimately murdered. George Thomas, uh, nice outfit. Yeah, he, this guy was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to two consecutive life terms. Oh yeah, plus 25 years. So why is he testifying? What's the motivation? What, what's he got to, to, to gain from this? Well, they're, they're really looking to give him a much reduced sentence if he testifies, as you just heard a snip of it there, basically pointing the finger at Eric Boyd. With me at the moment here is Judge Brandon Birmingham. Thank you, Judge, for sticking around. I appreciate that. Uh, you've been following this case. Um, you know, how can you look at this witness, George uh, um, Thomas, as anything but a uh, guy out to help himself? Well, I think that is the key point that the defense is going to make. And in, this is a common thing when you have accomplice witnesses uh, that are testifying. So what's going to be critical is um, what is his recall of the facts and how did he come into contact with law enforcement? And did he make any statements before he was offered a deal? Uh, and is the state going to be able to prove that? That's how they can rebut the charge that he's just trying to help himself out after being convicted and sentenced to, to life twice. Yeah, it almost sounds a little desperate to me. In fact, the, the big question I kept asking myself was why Eric Boyd and why now? He's already been convicted, serving 18 years for the accessory charges and convictions. Uh, yeah, what do you think it is? What, what do you think is driving this prosecution? Well, I think in every case there is a strong desire from the prosecutors as well as from the victims in a case to have closure. They want to have every person accounted for uh, and held accountable for the crime. Perhaps there was evidence, physical evidence probably, that was unexplained and perhaps it was unexplained until we have Mr. Thomas to come in and fill in the blanks. And maybe that's why they offered him such a sweetheart deal to fill in some of the blanks that might have been left over from the physical evidence. Yeah, and there's, there's a ton of blanks when it comes to that physical evidence. Let's listen to some more of this star witness. Remember, you know, if you're the jury taking this in, you got to process why this guy is here and what he's got to say. Here's more George Thomas. Correct. Okay, Mr. Thomas, hold on. Hold on a sec. I, I have to do some math here. You are in a house that is roughly 805.8 .8 square feet, which is, you know, you can look around your own homes and figure out sizes, but figure a, a, an average motel, hotel room times two. That's, that's the size of this entire house. He hears nothing. He hears nothing being done to the victim, Shannon Christian. Okay, uh, Joseph Scott Morgan is with me, uh, perfect guy to figure this mess out, forensic death investigator, and uh, also with me, of course, Judge Brandon uh, uh, Birmingham. Let me start with you, Joseph, come on. I mean, that's just strains, uh, you know, credibility on all levels. How do you not hear what was clearly going on in the house to kill this girl? I don't know. We used to be in Sunday school when they were kids. When we were kids, they used to say, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little ears what you hear. I have to say, uh, this guy, uh, what was in his mind? What did he behold? The reality is, is that he is convicted. And you can't sit here and tell us, reasonable people, that you were not aware of what was going on in that residence. And Michael, I've seen these crime scene images. I've seen uh, some of the images uh, that are floating about and they are absolutely horrific. And e even if it's just a passive thing where you're not going to interdict this situation, you have an awareness that something is going on, it, it goes beyond the pale of just ac acceptable behavior uh, among, you know, in society. It's just absolutely disgusting. Yeah, it's inhuman. And I mentioned earlier how the images are just outrageous. I've seen a few of them. I don't wish them on anybody. And uh, it, it is rare that I would go as far as to say that. Let me ask you this, Judge. Is it odd that this witness is in his uh, jailhouse jumpies? I mean, what, why is he not kind of cleaned up a bit? Uh, you know, the DA could have decided you know, look, this guy is involved in something pretty bad. It's no secret that he's in custody. It's no secret that he got sentenced. It's going to be no secret that he was convicted and sentenced to life. So let's just keep him exactly how he is, raw uh, and, and hopefully truth-telling. Although, you know, there is a reason why we asked jurors to consider the demeanor and whether or not something that the witness says is reasonable. I don't know whether it's reasonable what he's saying about not being aware or not hearing any of this stuff, but that may be a reason why uh, they are, are trying to asking some of the questions they're asking him in the way that he looks right now. So it sounds like the theory is, you know, we're not going to hide anything. This guy is a criminal. Come on and wear your criminal suit. 
um, you know, maybe that'll make us somehow, as the prosecution, more credible because we're not hiding the fact that he does live in this striped suit all the time. Okay, I, I, I don't know. Who knows what juries focus on? We're going to find out more about this case, though, coming up. Just to give you a reminder, they are on a break right now. They've had ME testimony, medical examiner testimony, for uh, uh, an appreciable time, and it is some heavy, weighty stuff. So we're going to get back into that courtroom as soon as they're live. In the meantime, more to catch up on. Come right back. This is the Law and Crime Network. The court getting back in action there in Tennessee versus Eric Boyd. And before we continue with the medical examiner, uh, Ms. Darenka Malinshek Polchan, I want to hear from our expert, Mr. Forensic Death Investigator Joseph Scott Morgan. What do you expect from the defense here? Uh, well, what they're trying to do, you know, when it when it comes to the timing of the death, there there is a certain level of torture that's involved in this. It was an excruciating uh, last moments of life. That this young lady uh, went through, and it, it it lasted for a protracted period of time, Michael. And what they're trying to pin down here is uh, how long did it take? Some of these injuries that she sustained are what are referred to in a perimortem state. That means that she was in the throes of dying, but it took some time for this to happen. The doctor has been discussing the hemorrhage and the surrounding tissues. Uh, I, I know just on reflection that uh, this young lady was uh, that she was she was tortured. In her vaginal area, uh, her anal area, she was actually kicked several times. There was evidence of that. And this was a slow bleed that took place. And then you compound that also with the pouring of the bleach down her airway and also the suffocation element. So all of, there's a big timing factor that goes on, and it gets kind of complex biologically. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, it, it all unfolded in this little room. In fact, I believe she was found quintuple bagged in a trash yes. can in yep. the room right there. Let's go back into courtroom yep. for this cross-examination. Not all that surprising that the cross with this uh, witness is short, because remember, let's take a step back. Horrific crimes, horrible uh, torture to these victims. But Eric Boyd, the defendant on the uh, at the defense table there, is uh, not really... Uh, the guy who's arguing these things did not happen. So if you're defending him, you're not really going to focus on those events. You're going to focus on what does or doesn't tie your guy to those events. Uh, let me ask you this procedural question, uh, Judge Brandon Birmingham. Seems to me, and I've heard them just to, not just today, but in other days, a lot of questions I'd be uh, objecting to as incomplete hypotheticals. They're just throwing out like bits and pieces. Assume this, assume that, but, but really not a full story that would be appropriate. Any thoughts on that? I think those questions are designed uh, by the lawyers to corroborate or tie together what the witnesses either have said or are about to say. There's going to be a charge that's given by the judge in this case that tells jurors they cannot convict based on the testimony of an accomplice witness unless they believe uh, that there's some type of physical corroboration outside of the testimony of the uh, witness themselves. And so these hypotheticals are given to the jurors and they're designed to answer that question for them. It just seems like there's so many holes in the hypotheticals that, uh, you know, it, it leaves the, uh, the witness to speculate, and that's inappropriate. But, hey, no objections. And, again, maybe that gets to what I believe to be the defense position on this, which is, yeah, horrible crimes, brutal. Not my guy's problem. He didn't do those. So, uh, again, with me, uh, Joseph Scott, uh, Scott Morgan, forensic death investigator. Um, it was a very short cross by the defense. Um, any thoughts on what they had to say, what they were looking for? Yeah, they want to be able to mitigate uh, their 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 client's uh, involvement in this. This is graphic, nasty stuff that we're talking about, Michael, as we previously mentioned. And as quickly as they can, you know, kind of get the forensic pathologist uh, off the stand, the better, because she is a stark reminder of the devastation that was left behind. Uh, you know, the way she had had these bodies photographed, uh, the way she documented them in their notes, and also. She's a leading expert, and she brings her opinion to this, and she can talk about this in detail. Trust me, uh, for the defense, they're playing with fire the longer they keep her up there. They want her out of sight, out of mind as quickly as possible. Yep, and get those ugly photos off the screen for the juror, about 24 of them from my count. So what we, what, what we heard earlier today from this medical examiner, by the way, she not only was excused, but they have wrapped for the day there in Tennessee and in the Knoxville area. So it gives us a great chance to catch up on what was some pretty intense testimony from the ME and others earlier today. Let's start with the ME. She's talking in, in this particular little bit here about the, the injuries and the ultimate death to 
Chris Newsom. Let's listen. So there's Dr. Melisnik Polchan. She's the medical examiner, and what a, uh, what, a, what a brutal job in this case with the two deaths, Shannon Christian and Christopher Newsom. Remember, she's testified at least twice before, exactly as you're hearing her testify there. In this case, the details of the death of Christopher Newsom shot three times. Uh, and, and uh, you know, the jury got to see some photographic evidence to support her findings, and it wasn't good. Let me ask Judge Brandon Birmingham a, a, a kind of a procedural question. I have to assume in this case, where we have the really the fifth defendant in, in a line of, of evildoers, if you believe the prosecution in this case, um, there had to be a lot of motions in limine early on to how they were going to cut and parry this different evidence and what was going to be allowed. There were 24 photos introduced from the ME into this case. There had to be hundreds. How do you handle that as a judge? I basically take the pictures one at a time and each picture has to serve a particular purpose. The purpose can be the location of the wound on the body, um, uh, how that wound might have uh, degraded in time, and also only those pictures necessary to allow the expert to explain themselves and nothing more. Usually one picture per injury is sufficient. So you got a lot of injuries in this case, and certainly there could be the argument that, hey, uh, you know, this is, this is overkill, this is prejudicial because they are so outrageous. Uh, do we really need four angles of the one wound to the head? Can't we get by with two? How do you as a judge deal with that? I mean, that's, it's your call. You've got to make sure that you allow the prosecutors uh, to explain their theory to explain their evidence to allow the witness to give their opinion without being prejudicial so if it can be explained in one picture then you use one picture but if there's a legitimate reason to have two well then maybe you can have two but you've got to keep in mind that you're only allowed to give them evidence that's probative and not prejudicial yeah and it is a fine line to walk joseph scott morgan let me ask you have you ever had to uh, kind of lobby for certain demonstrative or or photographic evidence that you felt was so important uh, yeah, yeah, actually I have, Michael. Uh, I, I think back to a case that I had was uh, actually a hit on a, on a family uh, in, in New Orleans when I was working there. We had three bodies uh, in, a, in a room and there were multiple angles uh, from, from the shots that were taken. And for when you're considered there's three bodies in the particular case I'm talking about, there are going to be multiple perspectives and multiple uh, lines of sight at the scene. So you combine all of those photographs from the scene, all of those photographs at the autopsy, and you're trying to paint a picture photographically. Remember, all of this is past in time. You can't go back and see it again without the aid of photography. So it's a fine line that the judge has to walk here uh, trying to decide what they will and will not allow. Most of this is done in pretrial. Yeah, and as I mentioned, the motions in limine had to be plentiful in this case. And I just keep thinking of that jury having to look at some of these photos uh, that some of us here have looked at. And, and, you know, part of their job, a job you can be glad you don't have. We're going to take a quick break. We'll come back. We're going to talk more about the Eric Boyd case and all of the, the issues surrounding him and his co-defendants when we come back to the Law and Crime Network.